Good afternoon, everybody. This is quite in what I would call enthusiasm at this time on a Sunday afternoon. Um, also with this title, which can only be meant as a joke because it's impossible to cover what is necessary to do that. But um, anyway, um, looking at the, uh, the name dropping here, it uh, becomes really hilarious because all of these subjects are obviously by themselves, uh, you know, feeding entire workshops and conferences and so on. But we will do some scratching of the surface of all of these. And I'm going to take a couple of minutes more than usually for this talk that's been uh, given a couple of times already on uh, conferences by my colleague, uh, Max Neuenhofer, um, to spend and uh, go dive a little deeper into resilience and consensus. But anyway, these are the subjects. We're talking distributed databases and um, uh, what I'm not going to touch upon is what it takes to already create a good database. So when I joined ArangoDB um, two and a half years ago, my background is theoretical physics uh, and then PhD in medical imaging and so on, did really fancy stuff as I thought. Uh, doing computations uh, on uh, high performance uh, cluster environments, uh, reconstruction of medical images that were completely lost uh, uh, for diagnosis, and uh, we made them shiny and nice and diagnostic again. And then I joined ArangoDB and I thought, these people, I can teach something. And um, that was a very, very hard landing, as you can imagine. Databases are probably, after operating systems, the toughest business in the trade. The amount of work and uh, um, concentration that you have to put in a in a single instance database is already insane. And uh, we are now going on the network and doing all the fun stuff that is really going to have, has to fail at some point. All right. Um, okay, consensus, really fun, really interesting subject. Um, and then we're going to visit one of the oldest businesses of the business, uh, the sorting. Um, then uh, I'm going to do some name dropping, the last three subjects. We just look what it means, uh, what, what it achieves inside ArangoDB, what it can do, and uh, why they are necessary if you want to do things like uh, cluster-wide transactions and so on. Okay. Yes, the bottom line is the bottom line here in this case is uh, that you actually do computer science. Um, we do, none of the stuff that I'm going to show you is uh, made by us or published initially by us. We have uh, implementations, maybe better ones, uh, maybe worse ones, but we have implementations of these and we really had to go to the hard uh, business of making them work. Lots of cases you will see al algorithms just very broadly, uh, scientifically explaining things, but then at some day you will end up on a main board with a CPU and RAM connected with copper to some switch and so on, and then the whole thing becomes an entirely different ball game. And uh, time suddenly matters and is not linear, it seems, at, at times, and so on. This from a physicist. Okay. Modern data store is distributed. Nobody wants to run a, a database anymore on a single engine and uh, assume that a day will come when it cannot scale out anymore. The application will suffer get slower, maybe even crash. Uh, I should have maybe said it the other way. Most of the cases, you will probably have a crash rather than just becoming slow. When you become slow, you've done a really good job coding already. <clears throat> okay. Why is it important that different parts of the software need uh, agree on things? Let's say you're starting a database and you are creating within your database software a dedicated data set for database for a specific task, and then you have um, tables or collections like in a NoSQL database like ArangoDB. And um, this whole knowledge about uh, the structural stuff inside the database, we always assume as a given, right? We just create a database and assume it's going to be there the next day. And we create a collection or a table, we assume the table's going to be the next day there when we come with the next select statement or, in our case, an AQL statement. 
The thing is that this is not trivial at all on a network. So if you have eight computers or 1,000 computers that need to agree on a certain configuration of the entire thing, this is already anything but trivial. So on a single instance, you would have a configuration file, or you have some sort of a, a file where this kind of information is stored. And as long as nobody really breaks the file system, nobody deliberately deletes that uh, it has a malicious intent, if you will, you can depend on that. On the network, this thing, uh, there is no such thing as a ground truth unless you create one. Um, Technically, you would think to yourself, okay, we are on a network, right? We have a lot of computers. We can just pass around the stuff. So in this case, we even don't only um, create ground truth, but we've even replicated it. So in case somebody goes, we still know the ground truth. Well, the thing is that it doesn't, it turns out that it's not so easy after all, because on a network, a couple of things can happen. You can have outages at any time. Now, how, do you, how often do you want to send something that is supposed to go to everybody? Uh, something that is on the network actually uh, current, or is it something that was sitting on a TCP IP stack of a computer that was detached from the switch because the port was flailing or whatever? Is this thing coming in five minutes later? Is this Does this still apply? Let's go to a bank account. Let's say you have three operations, um, add 100 euros, uh, check if the 100 euros are there, and then deduct 50 of them or something. What is obvious is you cannot take the money off before the 100 went in. So these kind of things really matter. The order of, uh, of which you create your truth is also important. It's not just somewhere you have a variable A equal to zero or to 12 or something, but you probably have a state machine of some uh, um, real complexity. Packages are dropped, are delayed, are duplicated. Um, disks fail, of course. Uh, I'm sure everybody's had all of these so far machines fails, racks fail, entire data centers fail. Um, yes, and we haven't even talked about things that just uh, happen maliciously. By the way, not that we couldn't, we could solve that problem. It's uh, on a different page, I assume. Um, there is one protocol that uh, has been discussed since ages. It's uh, 1989 is almost as uh, is the beginning almost of computer science, you would say. Um, Leslie Lamport, um, uh, who is now with Microsoft Research, published a paper that is really fun to read, at least a couple of pages into it. Um, it's uh, taking a monk monastery, a picture of a monk monastery somewhere on the Greek island of Paxos, where a uh, elector of uh, monks is. Um, convening at all times, really, during the day to make decisions. And those decisions are then written down in notebooks of monks. And now, after a couple of days, you want to know, well, what is the current law, really? And that's the way the paper is written. I think initially, when he was giving the first talks, he was dressed up like a Greek monk. Uh, people didn't understand the humor, so he stopped doing that. Um, but um, it's really fun uh, paper to read. And then it took ages until 2013. Diego Ungaro wrote, a, wrote his PhD thesis. And the uh, funny story behind that is that um, his professor tells him, um, look, there is this consensus algorithm out there. Um, why don't you go, it's called Raft. And there have been a couple of publications. Uh, by the way, who does consensus for a daily business? Anybody here? You? Okay, at least one person. This is more than usual. Uh, people just take it for granted, seriously. It's just, I will come to that. You will be surprised how um, much brain you got to invest in this tiny little detail. Anyway, so um, student goes off. Come, uh, they meet a couple days later. He tries to explain him the paper. And like uh, three minutes into uh, the discussion, he says, stop this. I don't get uh, what you just said. How does this work? And he said, um, I think you have to pull the first and then press the button and whatever. You, he explained, he said, I don't get this. I said, okay, now when I think about it, I don't understand it either. They tried this multiple iterations and came up with the idea, we gotta solve this problem for good. And when you listen to, there are nice talks out there. Uh, go on YouTube, you will find the original talks that uh, were given to the subject. Um, the only goal was make raft simple. 
the that is that was seriously that's what they say at least today um, that the entire design goal was anything that we decide how the protocol is supposed to work must be easy to understand or we don't do it period then we just don't invent a new protocol okay let's go through that in a moment after I have just also maybe explained that the original Paxos implementation is not technically a um, um, an implementational paper. It's just discussing the matter and explaining how it should work and how it could work. There have been a lot of publications after that, and uh, so Paxos has become effectively a family of protocols, really. You see things like M-Paxos, E-Paxos, S-Paxos, I don't know, whatever uh, combination of uh, characters and Paxos that are out there. They all try to solve the issue that the original paper, as um, good, good as it is and as well as it proves the fundamentals, is not really an implementational paper. Raft is, again, completely different, supposed to be simple, the detail, the protocol is explained in complete detail in the original publication and a lot more detail in the PhD thesis, which is also available online to read. And um, also, um, before anybody starts running out the door implementing Raft for something that they do on the network, this is a design bottleneck. There is a leader to the whole outfit, we will see that in a moment, and this doesn't scale. So you can't take Raft and uh, throw 100 computers at it and make it, um, say, 50 times faster. Yeah, that's not going to happen. The 100 computers will become as slow as one computer. I, but I will explain in a moment why that is and how it is still useful. Um, yeah, so Max's idea is, and I left this in there, although I do disagree a little bit, and I can't, um, I will say in a moment why. And he always says, I'm going to give you an advice, although, although nobody likes an advice. But seriously, it's really fun. Read Paxos uh, in bed or wherever you have some time. And uh, seriously, don't implement it. That's true. Okay, Because it's just old. It's um, interesting because it's part of computer science. It's significant uh, decade, two decades. It uh, was uh, out there alone. And um, then take Raft. And if you like, actually implement it. I'm not so, so sure you shouldn't do it, but I'm going to tell you something. The thing, uh, the moment you want to really operate a uh, service on top of it, it's going to become really not so much uh, fun anymore because you will find out that you need a lot more than that's actually um, in the original paper. You need to take care of things like compaction. You need to take care of uh, things like the fact that the world is, and we have, we don't have real time systems, but we have time shared systems with a lot of processors. There's a lot going on. There is maybe a log rotation going on somewhere else. There is a real network attached to your computer and so on. So you're trying to take a proven, uh, there's a formal proof to raft in the, uh, in the paper, a proven protocol and try to actually implement it in real life. It will remain tricky. It took us way longer than we thought. Originally we thought, Four weeks, it ended up something like 12 months or so. And then the bug fixing that went on and on. And we just recently, as Eva just mentioned in his talk, we just recently, by the, uh, by the grace of the Kubernetes operator, found significant bugs still in the agency, which uh, the, is the raft implementation in ArangoDB. OK. Um, OK, how does this work? I'm going to flip through all these. Um, we have a bunch of servers. Um, and uh, what is really important to us is not the state machine by itself, but it's more the order of instructions that came in to create that state machine. So if we take my bank account, we really are interested in the order of everything that happened to it during the last year, in sequential order. There is no payment of the company on my bank account before some other event happened that actually withdrew that, that uh, uh, after, sorry, that withdrew that money again and so on and so on. This is, this is really important because you might just go ahead and change your state machine in your state machine in value by an increment of one. So if the value before the increment of one was wrong, um, your result after that will also be wrong. Just by doing an increment, in other words, you're not fixing it down the road accidentally, while an 
uh, assignment would do that, for example, right? If you had, you would set x to 100 because it's not assuming anything uh, before, it's going to be correct still. But you really can't work like this, right? Just imagine for a moment, I just said configuration and so on, you would just drop a database because it's no longer in that, uh, in that state machine. So the order of the events is important. Uh, everything is replicated to everybody in the same order. That is, if you go on every one of the computers that are part of this consensus, they will all have all the instructions with the same index, by the way, in the same order in their RAM and persisted somewhere to this so that after a disaster or after an outage or whatever, you can restart your cluster again, obviously. <clears throat> the, third, the first thing that happens really in the system um, in a rough uh, network is you need to find a leader. Before you don't have a leader, nothing is going to happen. This is after every restart, the same story over again. After every failure of a leader, the same story over again. The way usually you would do that is uh, actually, well, is um, find a way of not having everybody uh, try to rush for the leadership, but bring in some order, some element of uh, randomness or so to it. In this case, um, what happens is once you haven't heard for a little while from a leader or you just started and there was no leader, you will reset a local clock to some random value between a minimum and a maximum. Let's say between one tenth of a second and a second. And you will wait, uh, wait that random time. And once your time uh, is over, you start a leadership. There is a very nice toy to play with and get a, a grasp of, the, um, of how it works. And we will play with that in a moment. I'm not going to give you too many details for, uh, on that because it's uh, much easier to see. Once you have a leader, uh, the leader is ready to, to append instructions to its replicated log. So you can give it all sorts of information. Let's cre we are creating a database in this huge cluster of ours. And so somebody is writing all the necessary skeleton information of that database into, what, uh, into our agency, into the replicated log. The DB servers out there will see that, do some stuff, write their own stuff into that, and so on and so on. That's evolving. So this is the state machine. This is the replicated log that's going on. Um, and um, the, the, something becomes the truth, and you can respond to a client who wanted to write in it once you have spread that information, that specific information, in that specific order to, all, uh, to a majority of the other servers. Which means that if you have three servers, then that majority is fixed to two. If you lose one server, it will remain two. You're still able to operate, but if another one fails, you're out. You can't answer because you can't know if you're not just a split brain, you're just uh, segmented away from the network because your switch broke, or is it just because the others went down? You just can't answer. You can't even tell uh, what is uh, the value for X, for example, in your key value store. You have to stop operation. And um, you also have to make sure there's only one leader out there. Uh, the unique leader, if there wasn't a unique leader at all times, regardless of if you have a split network or not, uh, that would be a dis um, just a recipe for disaster, obviously. Um, it's not easy to get it right. I'm not sure if it's not fun. Uh, some parts were actually fun. It was very, very enlightening in many ways. But um, again, getting it to work is not easy in the end of the day. And then it turns out that these things like compaction and so on really make things a lot more complicated than the original protocol itself. OK, um, let's actually play Raft a little bit. Here it is, open still. I'm going to rewind this to, to the beginning because it's like four seconds into its life. All right, um, five computers, part of this uh, raft network. And the first thing they do, as I said, is try to uh, elect a leader. You see already these um, um, gray uh, partial circles around the, the, the um, orange uh, circles. Um, and these are uh, the time presets, what I told you about this random thing that we are going to set at the beginning. And I'm going to start this whole thing. And it looks like S1 is going to win the race. When time's up, it starts, it sends to everybody a command, vote for me. And in this case, it was successful and everybody 
um, just uh, agreed to that. So anybody who would have come first would have gotten that uh, um, positive uh, answer. You can imagine that two of these times end up being the same, right? This is random, but it's not a big deal. Then maybe three vote for one, two vote for the other. The two votes are not enough, but the three votes are enough to become a leader. And the next round, the the new established leader, because it knows that it's got a majority vote, will suppress the other two also. It will tell them, vote for me, and this time they will vote for uh, for the new leader. This is fairly robust. It works very, very easily. So even if you have a leadership change and you have massive load on your uh, network and uh, massive load on your computers or so on, you do end up electing a leader fairly quickly. And um, it's also clear that as long as the rough thing is not working, just because we don't know what the ground truth of our cluster is, no, there isn't, we are not talking about the data that you're actually putting into the database. We're talking about the structural data. We're talking about the, um, uh, what databases are out there, which collections are there, which indexes are there, and vice versa. What DB server is uh, hosting, which shard of what collection, and so on. This kind of information is in there. When the raft network goes down, the entire cluster will stop responding. Everybody start uh, screaming in their log messages uh, something about a, a shaky network and so on. And really, there is no other way to uh, to work here. Um, this is the cap theorem, right? You can have consistency, availability, or what is the other one? Um, usually, somebody knows to help me out. <laughs> Thanks, part. So you can have two on, of these only at the same time. And we at OrangoDB, we uh, um, value in this case as a database consistency more and let's say uh, availability. At that point, we just have to say, okay, if we go on from here and lie to a request, that's probably worse than just say, we don't know what's going on right now, uh, give me a sec. Okay, now we can also, for example, stop this lead, uh, and see what happens. Hey, why don't you just continue? Okay. Okay, time's gonna run out, as you can imagine, on S3, it seems. It's going to, unfortunately, S2 is not, ah, wait, yeah, see? So S2 was also quick enough, but uh, it was not uh, um, getting convinced enough of the other computers to become the new leader. Read it, it's really fun, play with it. Also, maybe do something like uh, send a request on the network like add a hundred euros to my to my uh, bank account and see how this information propagates through the replicated logs. These are the replicated logs on all the servers and so on. Unfortunately, I don't have more time for this. I could spend two days uh, explaining what is going on here. But again, you will find nice talks online. Uh, play with it. I I I am amazed by this tool because this is this is one opportunity great opportunity to understand the protocol really nicely when people do this kind of effort to, um, to make it easy for you to read the paper. And as playful this is, there is a real mathematical proof in there, actually. Um, yeah. Okay, um, sorting. Sorting is a big uh, business. It's been forever. As long as there's been computers, there's been sorting. Um, We're uh, unfortunately at a a place where um, modern hardware has made most of the algorithms that we know that are taught in universities and so on pretty much rubbish. Really just because computers have changed a lot, right? Um, the problem used to be comparison computations. What happened since back then is that computers have uh, become CPUs 20,000 times faster but memory access is only uh, accelerated by a factor of 40. And then you also have 32 cores maybe on your um, CPU, and uh, which means that the balance has fallen by three orders of magnitude to the wrong side for all these nice papers. And um, okay, you have to deal with this because it's important. Actually, one of these uh, algorithms is not rubbish. I was lying just earlier. Um, is an algorithm called merge sort. And um, the merge sort lives, um, effectively is explaining how you try to uh, create merge data sets 
uh, first and then, uh, sorry, sort the data set first and then merge them somehow together. As a matter of fact, if you go on, let's say, Stack Overflow and look for how do I get two C++ vectors sorted into one big one, um, you will see pretty much people putting out this merge sort protocol. The problem is that um, you're still hitting the same kind of issue, that every time you go to grab something out of these uh, um, vectors here, uh, your sorted vectors, you're hitting the memory wall. You're going to have a cache miss, and this is going to cost you dearly. The performance is going to end up being the performance of a CPU, really just because your memory bandwidth, and uh, you're only having these cache misses. If you appreciate the inner workings of a CPU, however, you know that there are CPU registers right at every core, and then there are uh, multiple layers of caches that go all the way to the memory bank out there. Every time you need something, you would hope that you can get somewhere where you would get as much from cache as possible. Of course, you have to go to main memory to get stuff to come back and pretty much feed your algorithm. But the thing is that as long as you do that in a sequential uh, manner, you only hit one cache miss and then grab a bunch of data and brought them in. The idea here is that we invest in ArangoDB this um, um, data structure that we call a mean heap. A mean heap is a balanced uh, binary tree. Balanced means that it's just not very, very long in one side and shallow in other places. And we populate um, it with a syncing algorithm stuff from these sorted vectors into this binary tree. And the idea is that the only rule in there would be that any dot that is above others is going to have a smaller value. This means that with a little luck, if you do that syncing properly, you end up doing the comparisons only on the, in the cache now. This whole min heap you design obviously on your, your specific system to fit in the cache, and it, everything that is um, coming in there is coming even also through local memory. So if you're thinking of a NUMA architecture, you're feeding uh, 32 processors from uh, located uh, from localized memory effectively and end up doing the comparisons 95% of the time in the cache. If you compare, if you then go on your computer and make a top, you see 32 processors actually maxed at 100% doing sorting only. If you, I haven't given you any details to the syncing algorithm, the code is online, it's not so much. You have to do it carefully, but it can be done. Um, of course, ArangoDB's code is online because this is an open source conference, right? Yes. So um, you can actually go and check the syncing mechanism that we built for that, but effectively it's ginormous. You can do the sorting in uh, uh, insane speed. Now, why would you sort stuff if you have a database? Well, usually people don't just throw in stuff into a database and then never care for it. They come back and will ask you to give them some of the data. And they will probably have a discriminatory filter of some sort on it. And hopefully there is an index sitting on that uh, discriminatory field. And uh, that's why we have to do the sorting, right? An index is nothing else but an inverted key value store um, based on that specific field or maybe uh, com com combined uh, index of multiple fields um, that you can use to quickly grab something that's been looked after. So the merge sort. Um, right. The next uh, problem is, um, let's say we have a computer that has 16 gigabytes of RAM and we have one terabyte of ultra-fast SSD attached to it. And um, people would assume that when they start writing data in, that the data really gets written quickly, that you're not waiting for a long time to get some data through. And this is super crucial, okay? This is not just some nice gimmick that you give to the customer. If you cannot suffice uh, this kind of, the speeds that are necessary to deal with today's data, the problems appear somewhere entirely different. Then your uh, maybe your entire threading mechanism starts suffering badly from this congestion and so on. So it's not just that you're slower, you're creating a huge set of problems for the customer as well as for your own 
uh, processes and so on. It's absolutely crucial that we can do bulk inserts very, very quickly. But at the same time, that software or person would also like to come while you're doing these bulk inserts um, in to uh, give you very quickly stuff out. And most of the cases you will see that um, either the classical B tree structured uh, um, algorithms and so on will fail in one of the bottom two, one way or the other. Log structured merge trees are a um, nice um, idea here. You start writing data bulk inserts from the top into this um, picture that you see here. So everything that you're writing, you're writing uh, into the level zero. You have as a discriminatory value some key or of some sort, and um, with the value of that key, everything is sorted in different bunches. Everything that you get, you just sort directly and keep in memory, and at the same time make a write-ahead lock on disk and keep a copy on disk for a power outage and so on. While you cannot say anything about the... Well, they are all sorted, right? But you don't know which key ended up going into which chunk here. Um, you don't have to, because the next level that it, where the data trickles down to is a level where you don't, at least while they are sorted, you look that the keys don't overlap anymore. And then this goes on, down, further, further, until on every machine, all your shards of your data will look something like the bottom. The problem is that, okay, this is nice, you can put a lot of bulk inserts. Ah, something that I forgot to mention. Every time that you pack up such a bar on the top, you don't touch it anymore. It's, not, it's immutable. It just gets written once to disk and to RAM, and uh, dependent on parameters that you can give a RangoDB or other databases, you will wait for the syncing to disk first before you answer or not. It depends on how important the data is. Session data might not be as important as customer data, as payment data, and vice versa. But at the end of the day, um, you don't touch these, these bars anymore. Every time you pack something like this, the only way of getting rid of stuff and making you is repacking what we call compaction. So what is compaction? Does everybody know what compaction is? Compaction effectively means that, okay, there have been a lot of stuff that came in. Somebody said X is equal to one. Somebody else said raise X by one. And then some, sometimes later, somebody came in and said X is equal to 12. The x is equal to 1, and the raising by, uh, by 1 are of no importance anymore, right? I can just throw these information away, but I would never open a file like this and try to restructure stuff. I will just take whatever is still of importance and create a new file and sort stuff and so on and so on. Okay, this doesn't still help with reading quickly out of this um, structure because... Um, yeah, where would you find the specific key? At, at what stage of trickling down is the specific information that you want? If you're lucky, the stuff is still in the hot set, and um, you have a nice, uh, clever uh, filter algorithm like the Bloom filter, which has, uh, for the size that it takes, a lot of very nice gimmicks. Um, what it does it, uh, is it is truthful about everything where it says, when you say, is this key in that bunch here, it will, when it says no, you know for sure, okay, it's not in there. If it says yes, maybe it's lying, you don't know, you have to look. Okay, but that good thing is that you hopefully don't touch 90% of these packages, right? That's the whole idea. Um, so um, there is a, a little fancier algorithm call, called Cuckoo that needs about the same amount of uh, data and is... Uh, giving you a better uh, probability as far as I remember. Unfortunately, I don't know anymore if we went down the cuckoo path in, because I remember there were some frustrations and uh, with the results that it did end up uh, delivering in ArangoDB, but we definitely use these kind of uh, tricks to be able to find the data in this um, LSM structure that I just uh, showed you in the other picture. So, very, very important. We first write just this bulk sorted data. We go on uh, keeping the stuff immutable. Out of those immutable bunches, we trickle down information into disjunct sorted 
uh, stuff and then end up having one big bunch sitting there uh, that is really nicely sorted and everything that you need uh, quickly found and delivered, even if it's on a storage somewhere. But again, together with the merge sort algorithm on the other page, uh, you end up creating a locality of performance that is um, uh, even extensible now beyond a single machine uh, on the network. As long as you keep the data local, you can do the sorting, you can do the answering of all, all of that uh, effectively uh, almost as quickly as if you were on a single server, with the exception that now you can scale on writes like crazy, hopefully, and uh, uh, don't forget uh, resilience. That is, when you lose a server, your data is still there. Um, this is used all over the place. I just uh, did some name dropping. Every big name in the, in the field does that already. This I will just touch upon very quickly. Problem of synchronicity. Why is that a problem? Well, if you have to debug something, if you have to find out what was first, you have to be able to establish causality. If you cannot... Um, do that, you're going to be screwed. If you try to depend on local times, local clocks, nice, but it's not going to give you everything. Uh, Max, out of some uh, uh, presumption of grandiosity, brought also the general relativity, which creates a... But trust me, it's not an uh, issue on <laughs> real computers. We are in the order of milliseconds. We are far away from what the general relativity with the speed of light on copper uh, wires and so on um, uh, messes up with this 20 milliseconds, probably somewhere in auto second order or something, whatever. What I um, uh, wanted to mention is um, there is there is tricks of lying about the time. Um, I put on a link here. I can't really go much into detail because I got shown that I don't have so much more time. Um, did I see I still have 15 left or 15 past? Thanks. Very good. I was surprised. Okay, I'm not going to rush uh, that much anymore. Right. Um, okay. What is the trick here? The trick is that with every message that you send across the network, this is really with every message, anything that gets trickled down in your cluster, every replication message, every... Uh, whatever it is, every every heartbeat, everything gets a time um, stamp attached to it. Not surprising, right? If you want to establish somehow an order. But the thing is that because the time, the, the clocks are going to be skewed, and you're not Google and can buy an atomic clock on uh, for every rack or something that is a million, just because you're going to meet to make ten millions out of it. You have to somehow work with NTP, and NTP is going to have this kind of skews, and it's fine. It's not going to be a huge problem most of the time. So what do you do? Every time you send any message, you send a timestamp. Every time you receive a message, it's going to have a timestamp. If you see that timestamp to be larger of any timestamp you've ever had, or any time on your own box is larger than the time that came in, you will establish a new time that is the maximum of these two times. Now, this can be kind of odd, right? If you imagine uh, your own daily business to work like this, you're going to screw up the most of the second part of the day. Because every time adding a second on top, if you're busy, it's maybe going to push you at some point uh, two hours off from the real time and so on. And this is not going to work, particularly if the rest of the people in the office are, remain, uh, are agreeing on the same time protocol. The good thing is that even if you have a busy cluster going at full speed, there are a couple of cycles to take a breath and the time to catch up with this fake time that you're um, administrating locally. Again, you get the idea, it's a little lying about something that is supposed to be a ground truth, but surprisingly, it helps getting things at least in order. So the time is not going to be so much of a real time, but it's going to at least help you get things in order in a cluster. And trust me, if you're uh, going back to Monday on Monday morning to a desk where you have to debug some really nasty crap, if it's involving five computers, it's not five times worse, but maybe something like 25 times worse. Actually, you can't put a figure on that. It can be a nightmare. Without um, the, 
uh, how do you say, uh, RR. Um, we use RR a lot in the office to, it's a nice tool that I think comes out of the Mozilla project. It's a deterministic debugger. You attach it at runtime to a cluster and later when everything is uh, broken, you are able to analyze a single machine of the cluster because RR collects all the system calls, all the network uh, transfer, and so on, allows you to find out what actually went wrong with the one server. If you attach a debugger to that server, what happens is everything stops, right? So if you think of, um, of the raft algorithm that I showed you, what happened to the one server that stopped sending stuff? It will immediately lose its leadership. So if you're trying to find a bug on the leader, yeah, right? You get the idea. So it's super important for us at least to know the order in which things uh, went down. Hey, I have a, actually a slide with all the information that I threw at you. Um, okay, here's the maximum that we take. And um, you always just, it's, you create this logical clock. That's why it's called the logical clock, right? It, uh, there's something wrong when you want to call something a logical volume, a logical clock. It's, it's probably not going to be real, right? Um, again, at least causality is um, preserved, and a couple of milliseconds of breath are enough to catch up with reality, so that your own clock exceeds that fake number that you've been keeping all along just because some server on the network is 20 milliseconds ahead. Okay, it's not going to work if it's one hour ahead, okay? We can agree on that. Your system is screwed then, right? Okay. Now, this is getting really funny because this is just name dropping now. Um, how do you um, uh, go about um, selling a database to anybody who's supposed to use it if you can't really deliver transactions? And I think for a moment you would have to create transactions on the cluster. What would you actually need? Well, the same thing that you need when you expect a transaction to work on a single server. There's a, um, this nice, um, uh, how do you, uh, um, anagram? No, whatever. It's probably not right. I should stay with computer science and physics. These nice names where you just uh, combine stuff to make, uh, whatever. ACID. ACID stands for atom atom atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. What does it mean? Well, atomicity means that you can actually um, have an entire such a thing as, uh, as a transaction. That is, you have brackets around a set of commands, and they are atomic. They're, when something is committed, it's committed the entire, committing the entire bracket or none of it, right? Not part of it, not something in the between, not the end of it. Consistency uh, says that every time that you actually do a commit, as a result, you don't allow somebody to get a read out of the database where only part of that atomic operation is actually visible to that read. This means that it's nice and great that you could commit the entire thing. Oh, out of power? Whatever. I'm just going to shout. Is that? OK. Ah, there. I am back. Probably somebody hacked my microphone. It's a hacker conference, probably. Um, anyway. So that consistency means that it's nice that you had atomic write, but do I actually see that entire transaction on the read that I'm getting? Isolation means that if you have multiple uh, transactions going on, that they don't affect each other. So it's not very helpful if a transaction is trying to put some money in bank, my bank account, and another transaction is putting some money in some other person's bank account, and these two transactions somehow influence each other. It's hard to, to sell that to a bank, right? And um, so that's what isolation is all about, and durability is obviously whatever you store in the database, you probably want to get back someday. So you have to look that it is pers uh, 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 persistent and that uh, you have some kind of a failover in case that it breaks. This is already hard enough to get right on a single server. When you go into the network, as you would imagine, everything gets really complicated. So the atomicity now needs an agreement of some sort. Now, I told you, if you take Raft, Raft is going to, is going to be a design bottleneck. 
It's impossible to take, to take your transactions and send them into a raft system. Well, it's not impossible. You can do that. Actually, that's what we do in the ArangoDB agency. But then you have to live. Uh, it's hard to explain why you take all these computers then to make things slower, right? Um, so what you can do, and this is something that we're just discussing actively in the company because we're not there yet, um, uh, is using the raft system for storing um, uh, transaction information, effectively the brackets. So the brackets that create these atomicity. How do you want to create a consistent snapshot? Take three DB servers that are replicated uh, another time, so altogether six servers, and um, you're trying to uh, put your transaction somewhere into the system on disk. What if one of the replica of one of the DB servers wasn't able to write that transaction because somebody yanked a power cable or an administrator uh, through a cup of coffee down on the uh, outside the million dollar uh, machine room on the whatever three plug cable cheap thing from the warehouse? I've actually saw that happen. This is not this is um, and um, so there. It's really really tough to roll back a, a transaction in a, a database cluster. It's insanely hard. And we actually had a shot at it uh, for a couple of months last year and realized that we are, have some insufficiencies in the class design of the abstraction layer where we are detaching pr uh, practically uh, storage engines and uh, the locking mechanisms that were involved. And we had to accept, OK, we have to do this properly again over. And uh, it's going to come, I'm sure. Uh, but it's I can't tell you when. Aha. Um, OK, and then um, the isolation part is going to be an entirely different ballgame because you have to be able to store something. Um, the effects of a transaction effectively isolate it somewhere until such time that you can flip a switch and say, this is the law of the land now. Whatever was in that transaction is now everywhere ground truth. Okay, while your other transactions might be go on, going on. This doesn't mean that the other transactions have to be successful, right? If there is a conflict, you will detect that conflict and roll it back, right? But that's exactly what isolation means. And then the durability, how do you handle a lost node? And trust me, that's even the smallest of these problems. Um, nearly all the databases that are out there that you know by name um, don't give you that on the, in the network. They nearly all of them cover that on a single machine. Um, and um, there are two um, uh, notable men uh, mentions because they've been actually one that has op been open source all, all along, I think, CockroachDB, and um, Spanner, um, which is closed source. Um, FoundationDB, Apple bought, uh, as most of you may know, and then just a couple months ago, uh, put it online and uh, made it open source. And we are doing our best to get there. Again, the, you see the parentheses around are not a typo. Um, because it's really freaking hard. Okay, one idea of how to accomplish what I just said, acidity in a cluster, is what is called MVCC, multi-version concurrency control. Multi-version, well, multiple transactions will have multiple versions, and these are going to be concurrently um, somewhere in your cluster before such time when you say the control is going to switch um, to the uh, correct um, transaction, make them visible. So writes and replication are done decentrally, and they are not um, visible from the other transactions. But then you have some place where you have a switch uh, that you can flip and then everybody at the same time knows all over the cluster, at least until such time that somebody comes and does a read request or another transaction is going to be written to disk. What is the ground truth currently? Um, yeah, this is just repeating what I said over and over again. Um, Timestamps obviously play a, uh, a massive role because you have to know what happened, what started when and ended when. And... Uh, with that, I'm going to put up links to all the clever people that did the work that we implemented in ArangoDB. And uh, let me see if I have. No, I don't have uh, any more links. I just would um, 
invite you to try ArangoDB. Uh, when I first used it, I thought, uh, what the hell? Um, and database with a UI, I thought they usually have just a prompt. And if the UI is going to be PHP MySQL and um, something like that, but um, there's a serious database behind it. Don't get shocked by a nice UI. And um, yeah, uh, please go on GitHub. And if you like it, um, um, star us. And uh, the slides are going to be my, my speaker page, and I'm sure on the conference page. With that, thank you very much for listening. You talked about scaling out, um, but you uh, mentioned that you uh, completely replicate the data in, in the cluster. So uh, scaling out is just scaling out for performance or also for data? Because that would require a partitioning, partitioning mechanism. You didn't talk about any of that. No, I, as I said, so um, I had actually a nice joke for, uh, to start with, and I forgot that, which is not something that I usually do. So on the page where I had all these nice names that I was going to talk about, I was going to tell you that this is going to be a very, very incomplete picture of what's seriously going on inside the RangoDB. And uh, so that page was pretty much trying to explain to people Europe by just mentioning London, uh, Schweinfurt, and uh, whatever, uh, Sweden, and some lake in Switzerland or so on. This is really all just patches. Yes, so in the RangoDB, both um, ideas are accomplished. You can um, scale data by sharding collections um, effectively without limit, um, practically probably with limits, and uh, also replicating data. So it's a totally um, normal kind of cluster when we have a customer run 50 d 15 dB servers uh, where you have shards replicated three times. So you have sharded your collections uh, over a lot of DB servers and all these DB servers somehow on some other DB servers are running replicas of the... And then in the agency, in the raft thing, there is um, a then absolutely vital part of ArangoDB sitting that is looking at all times, monitoring the entire cluster. This is the nice thing about Raft um, that I would like to uh, just mention as a side note is that if you really want to squeeze the last bit out of Raft is you probably put some some co uh, program store along on Raft. That is, you don't have just a state machine with val variables, but you also have some piece of code that you can just plug into that. And in this case, a supervision for the cluster that at time, all times knows which DB servers have given out and where shards need to be uh, some DB servers are supposed to become new leader of some shard, and then some other replica is uh, assigned, and vice versa. So, yes, it becomes very, very uh, complicated in the back end, but uh, ArangoDB doesn't only uh, replicate, but uh, shard. Okay, one question. Hey, ah, there's another one. Okay. Uh, I'm not very familiar with this topic, but a lot of this uh, has some parallels with the blockchain technology, I think. Uh, so how would you uh, see, what similarity could you see in there and uh, why not using like something like blockchain in this yeah. Uh, topics? Yeah, so the, I'm not an expert on the blockchain, so my answer might not be completely correct, okay? That's the disclaimer. But yes, blockchain is a um, uh, consensus protocol, uh, but it is also uh, got some limitations that are not so great, which is, for example, a blockchain, as we can see with Bitcoin just now, uh, at some point might hit some kind of an arti artificial limit and needs to be um, you know, made larger or something. And um, also the way a blockchain um, trickles down information is compared to what you can do with Raft uh, by its nature, uh, slower, and a blockchain will also live with some inconsistent state um, at some places. 
So you can have a transaction that is in your own blockchain, not in the majority of other blockchains. And you would actually report on that if somebody would ask you. So uh, there are some uh, fundamental com um, compar comparable parts, but I think in general, it's um, uh, not really meant for this kind of uh, ground truth. It's more... Uh, so I would compare that maybe between having your revision control uh, completely spread over notebooks all over the world, or do you have a central server? I think that maybe easy best describes the comparison. I hope that was true first and uh, helped second. <laughs> right. Thanks, everybody. This is a Sunday afternoon. I'm flattered. Thank you very much.